I would like to announce the first speaker's morning session. That is Amoy. She doesn't. We go anywhere. Raise my voice. That we would like to announce the first speaker's morning session. That is Amoy. She doesn't. We go anywhere. She doesn't. Raise my voice. That we would talk about the truly unique differential equation. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for coming at 9 a.m. I know it's difficult. And so, first of all, thank you to Alexei for inviting me. And thank you for supporting the travel uh, for the NSF grant. So this is going to be about uh, differential equations. But since I'm more of a computer scientist, I will also explain how uh, I came to that question. Because I think it's interesting for its own sake. And, of course, it's joint work with two of my co-authors. So the question that I asked like some time ago, I was not the first one, is uh, what is a computer? And we'll see that that question actually leads to very interesting developments. So of course, if you ask that question to anyone, they will tell you what a computer is that's a laptop or anything that kind of resembles a laptop. But now a very, a very interesting thing is that if you come back uh, like a century in past in time, and you ask the question, what is a computer? Well, you might think they will not know what a computer is, but actually they do. And this is a computer, 100 years ago. So the one on the left, I'm going to talk about it uh, in the next slide, is called the differential analyzer. And the one on the right is actually a computer on a British Navy ship. So that is used to compute how you should fire and destroy the enemy. So those are completely mechanical computers that have nothing to do with computers like we have today. Nevertheless, they compute in some sense. And why am I interested in this question is because in computer science we have this so-called church thesis that essentially says any machine you can imagine that's reasonable should be equivalent to a Turing machine. So it should compute always the same thing. And we know this thesis is essentially true for all discrete models of computation. So all models that look like a computer. So a Turing machine, recursive functions, you can come up with logic, you can imagine Boolean circuits, you can do lambda calculus and rewriting, all of this is equivalent. Now, where it gets interesting is that now you go to quantum computers, and it so turns out that they compute the same thing, although uh, not at the same speed maybe. And now there's the machine I just presented before, like we call them analog computers. Are those really equivalent to a Turing machine? Well, it turns out sometimes yes, sometimes no. In fact, the question is, is this a reasonable computer becomes much harder. And you can also ask the question, well, sure, they compute the same thing, but do they actually compute at the same speed? And then you get into really hard questions like, are quantum computers really much faster than regular computers? So, you know, this is completely open. And if you go to analog computers, well, essentially the question is even more open because we don't even know how to define what it means for a computer to compute fast which may sound weird, like, you know, sure, we have time. I know if my computer takes one second or one hour, but defining this mathematically is really challenging if you go to analog computers. So it's, this is just to mention some uh, related <coughs> questions. So let's go back to this machine, this differential analyzer. So what is it exactly? Well, it's the Mathematica of the 1920s. So you have, you're a physicist and you have a differential equation and you know you try to analyze it, uh, it's difficult. So you want to simulate it numerically. What do you do? Well, you could you know do the calculation, do the uh, whatever iteration you want by hand. It's going to be really tricky. So no, you don't do that. You go and see Shannon, who is working on this machine actually, and you give him the differential equation. And then he's going to tweak a lot of things. So you see their gears, their disks. So he's going to program that machine and it's going to run it. So it's a mechanical machine. You have to turn a wheel. And you see there's a, a tracing table at the top. So it's going to plot the solution to your differential equation. So this is really what this machine is doing. It's implementing a differential equation with gears and, and stuff like that. And because Shannon was working on it, he wondered, but mathematically, what his device is really doing? Can we do all the functions and so on? So he came up with a model for this, and he called it the general purpose analog computer. So you see, it was already a computer. And for him, it was a circuit made out of gates like that. And you can, you can, have, you can have loops. I'll put one example, because it's not really practical to, 
think about gates like that. And then there was <clears throat> a long time during which people tried to come up with a more precise mathematical foundation for this. There were many mistakes. And eventually, people agreed that really this is the same thing as that a system of polynomial differential equations. So you have several variables. Variables intuitively correspond to different stuff in the machine. And then the derivative of each variable is a polynomial in the others. And you have some initial condition. And we'll see that that class is, well, it's, it's huge. It's, it contains a lot of things. And just to mention, like, initially, it might not seem like that class contains so much stuff. But in fact, what's really interesting about it is that you can rewrite many equations in that way. I mean, it's kind of obvious. I'll give an example, but for example, almost all of Newton mechanics is in there. And uh, if you're into biology, you can do reaction networks and stuff like that also in that class. So essentially, unless you have partial differential equations, your equation is probably of that shape. So here's one example. That's the only one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really give. So <clears throat> consider a pendulum. So uh, Newton's law of motion <coughs> tells you, well, this is the equation. And as you see, it really is not like in my class. It has second order derivatives and a sign. But using clever writing, introducing more variables, of course, you can turn the second order into a first order. And because the sign satisfies the differential equation, now with four variables, you have the same thing. And uh, if you are Shannon, so say you're the physicist 100 years ago, you had that equation, maybe you did that step, then you go to Shannon and he comes up with that thing. Okay? And now he uses it to program his computer and simulate the differential equation. So you see there wires and stuff. And just a, just a small remark about this. So people call this analog computing. Which is interesting because why, why, why do we call it analog? So today analog means the opposite of digital, but at the time analog just means you have two systems, they have the same equation, so therefore they're analog to each other. That's the original meaning of analog. Okay, so now there's an interesting thing about that class of functions, which is Shannon was really interested in that class for its own sake. So. Uh, define the class of all functions that, are that way. So they are one component of the solution of a differential equation. And he called it generable, although I'm not sure he used that term at the time, but let's call it generable functions. And as I said, it's an extremely large class of functions. Um, I mentioned it during the open problem session. Two examples of functions that are not in that class are Riemann, Zeta, and Gamma functions. But uh, all those functions and all those functions are analytic, but still it's, it's not so easy to come up with a function that's not in that class. So you can put a lot of things, but at the time he looked at it and he said, well, you know, gamma is not, not in there, zeta is not in there, that's a really small class of functions, it's not interesting for computability. I don't know why, because mathematicians really like the, the gamma function, I guess. So for, for him it was really not a strong computer in that sense. But now something interesting happened like uh, 15 years ago. People realized that maybe this class is considered weak in Shannon's sense just because it's the wrong notion of computability. And here uh, is, a is a striking idea. Just You can think about this. Um, is a scale computing any function? So here is a possible answer to that question. So you start with a scale. It has two masses, x and y, but you don't really know what they are. You just have them. So you put them on the bound scale and then you wait. Well, if it stays that way, that means x equals y. If it goes to the left, then x must have been greater than y, although you don't really know how much time it's going to take. And if it goes to the other side, well, you have the other thing. So maybe, just maybe, a scale is actually computing the sine function in, in some sense. And you can make this idea precise and prove something like start with an analog computer and let it evolve and eventually it has to go to the left or to the right. So that means it has to go uh, up or down. Call the up yes, call the bottom no. Well, actually this is a Turing machine. 
So you can show that those differential equations, in some sense, they're exactly as powerful as a Turing machine. So they are like a digital computer. So in fact, Shannon was wrong. Uh, this is really powerful. So this is the reason why I, I look at those equations. I won't talk about how you prove this result. I mean, it's, uh, it's a really technical result. But it's, this is just to mention that uh, you can bridge the gap between mathematics and computer science like this. So you can compute the zeta, but not in an obvious way. So yeah. Can so you, yeah, you can build a function that converges to zeta and all sorts of things, yeah. For arbitrary epsilon. Yes. In a uniform way, if you want, yeah. yeah epsilon would be part of the system. <clears throat> so, at the end, what we have is that we have on the left generable functions, so there's really the solution of those type of equations, and on the right we have this more modern notion of like the scale, so we let the system evolve and eventually make some kind of decision. But one thing uh, that I don't really like about this dichotomy is that surely there's something in between. Because on the left, what makes the gamma function and the zeta function not computable is the fact that we really want the function exactly everywhere. And that's really, really strong. And on the right, we've relaxed this completely. Like, we just want something at infinity. So maybe we could just ask, can we have the function, well, you know, closely everywhere, not just at infinity, but almost everywhere. And that's the, that's the question I want to look at. So something in between, like a uniform approximation scheme, if you will. And as it turns out, I wasn't the first one to look at that question. Um, Rubel, in 1981, looked at that question, although he came at that from a completely different perspective, I believe, and he proved the following result, which um, you must really take some time to digest, digest it. So the first time I read it, I thought it's clearly wrong. It's impossible. So what, what does it say? So it says you have a function f. So pick any function f in your head. Does it need to be uh, much more than continuous? So it could be really horrible. And then you're going to pick a function epsilon. So it means like around your function, you have to have a small like zone, but notice that the epsilon is a function of time. So you could take, for example, I don't know, epsilon of t equals exponential minus t squared. So it could go to zero really quickly at infinity. Just needs to be positive everywhere. So now you have your f, you have your epsilon, and what the theorem says is that now among all the solutions to that equation, there must be one that is always epsilon close to f everywhere on the real line. And notice that the equation does not depend on f and does not depend on epsilon. Surely that can't be right. Okay, so actually this, this is right. And I'm going to explain why this is a really weak result. So that's kind of a paradox to me, like the first time I looked at this, I was like, this can't be right. I looked at the proof as like, yeah, this is really weak, in fact. So, um, and then I'm going to explain how you can actually strengthen that theorem. So, how the hell is this possible? So, first, before I, I will give a proof of this, it's on one slide, so it's okay. Just um, some considerations. So, um, what's striking about this result is the fact that the equation is really, really short, like you can write it this way. That's really surprising. Actually, that was surprising to Rubel as well. Uh, it's kind of a miracle there that it's so simple. Uh, however, because of the way the proof is done, it's kind of clear that it's going to give you a differential algebraic equation of order 4. The fact that it's so small is, is the striking part. So, first of all, um, you might say, well, there is this equation. Notice it doesn't have initial conditions. So now you might ask the question, well, given f and given epsilon, is there a way to choose an initial condition such that the solution it defines is the one I'm looking for? Because sure, the theorem tells you there's a solution, but how can you describe it? Well, it turns out you can't. So uh, you take that equation and you can have finitely, like arbitrary, but uh, finitely many uh, initial conditions. It's never going to define a unique solution, ever. 
and you'll see because of the construction. In fact, the equation is meant that way. There is no way to add initial conditions as to define a unique solution. And the interpretation of Rubel is that this equation is so-called universal. But in fact, what is the meaning of a universal equation such that you cannot describe any solution in any reasonable finite way except by giving the solution itself? I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's more of a philosophical question, I guess. But the meaning of universality when the only way to describe an object is the object itself is kind of weird, I find. So, uh, in fact, Rubel knew about this problem and he asked, can you turn that equation into, say, an ordinary differential equation like, like this, so that at least there's unicity of the solution given initial conditions? And uh, actually, that's what we did in this work. So find uh, an equation that has a unique solution. So let's look at the proof, because I think you don't, you don't quite understand what's the problem unless you, you've seen the proof. So you can look at the picture or the math or both, depending on whether you like it. So first of all, I'm going to start with a bump function. Okay, so it, it's, it's really nice. It's zero everywhere except between minus one and one, and I took the exponen an exponential function. Okay, so already, uh, already that's a bad sign, because, uh, you know, here there's something uh, nasty going on, but okay, why not? And it satisfies that equation, you can check it. It's just, uh, it's just an easy computation. And now, here it gets more tricky. We're going to take that bump, and I will consider all possible translates and rescaling of that bump. So mathematically, we're looking at all the functions y that are c of the bump uh, composed with a translation. And now uh, it's really mechanical, but you can eliminate those parameters a, b, and c, and show that all those bumps they satisfy those equations. So here. Um, it's kind of somewhat clear that this should be true. What's not somewhat clear is that this equation should be so simple because you eliminate all those parameters. So it's like a, a Grobner computation, but it could yield something really nasty, but it doesn't. And now here is the thing that you should realize. That equation still has the property that is zero everywhere except on that bump. So if I take two solutions, I glue them together, they have this joint support that is still a solution. And of course, now uh, you can glue together as many bumps as you need, and you make a small observation, which is sure, it bumps from zero to something and back, then back to zero. But if you integrate a bump, where well, it sure looks like uh, an almost linear function. So in fact, if you integrate the sequence of bumps, like they can go negative as well, then you see that you've got an almost piecewise uh, like a piecewise almost pseudo linear function everywhere and those are dense in C0 so you'll manage to do it. So of course I've skipped like some details but not so many details like uh, it's technical but really that's the core of the proof. And so once you see this it's pretty clear there's no way to fix that result because it's non-constructive by construction. Uh, the fact that you're gluing those bumps uh, is the reason why fundamentally it's working and the reason why you cannot describe the solution with a particular initial condition. So it's unfixable, but we'll still manage to do it. And of course, um, I'll mention it just in passing, you can have more results of that <coughs> nature. So I believe <coughs> people have done it for, so you can do it for CK, like. You can approximate all the derivatives if you want. Uh, on a bounded interval, you can also approximate with other kinds of functions. So here it's done for a differentially algebraic function, but you can do it with other classes. And then you can also play the game of uh, the smallest order. So here the equation is of degree uh, what, 4 and has order 4, but I think you can gain one more. So I think you can do it at order 3. And I think it's possible to show it's impossible at order two. And then you can ask the question, what's the smallest degree do you need? Order three, it will be longer, right? 
Yeah, uh, probably. Yes, probably. Although I don't, there, there's a paper doing this, I think, at order three. I don't remember the equation. I don't think it's as neat as the uh, equation on that one. <clears throat> so here's the thing uh, we managed to prove. So we managed to prove that um, there is a fixed polynomial differential equation. So there's a polynomial P. It's given once and for all such that you have the same thing. So give me F, give me epsilon. Now I can give you an initial condition of the system such that the first component is always epsilon close to the solution F, to the function F. So notice that because we switched from differential algebraic equations to a system of ordinary differential equation, now I have many components. So I'm just looking at the first component. So the first component is approximating F everywhere on the real line. And by construction, if I give you an initial condition, the solution must be unique. That's by Cauchy-Lipschitz. And the fact that it exists everywhere is just given to you by the theorem. And if you don't like this formulation using several uh, components, you can also fix it. Uh, using, you can also do it with a uh, differential algebraic equation. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, I cannot give you the polynomial P. Uh, because it has about 300 variables, I think, because we construct it in an indirect way. So you could compute it, like there's the proof, and if you mechanically apply all the, the theorems and the lemmas of the proof, you can actually produce that P, but I mean, it's, it's going to be a nightmare. So yeah, don't do it. So it's really large. Um, and notice that we've gained something compared to the original result. The solution here is always analytic. Whereas Rubel's equation only gives you C infinity. So it's actually much, much stronger. And another remark for maybe more computer scientists. There is this question of this initial condition. Like this initial condition must be very strange for this result to happen. And in fact it is. So the alpha, I mean, I believe it's always transcendental. It comes from the proof. But you may ask, is this alpha coming out of nowhere, like it's God-given, or does it actually come from f and epsilon? So no, it's computable. So if you give me f and epsilon, I can compute alpha. But I do mean that in a really strong sense. Like if the f you give me is not computable, then the alpha is not computable either. But the alpha is computable from f. Okay, so if, maybe that's a mystery if you don't know computer science, but... Uh, Essentially, independently of how hard f is, the alpha is easy to compute from f. Uh, I'm sorry, alpha is d-dimensional, so sort of transcendental mean. Uh, there's there's going to be at least one component that's transcendental, oh. and probably all of them. Although you know it's probably hard to prove, but yeah, th there will be at least one because there's one that comes from a, a nasty system in, inside this big system. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure it helps. Um, no, because mainly, uh, I think we'll see an example. Like, I, I will give some parts of the construction, and you'll see the functions that are used, and it's more about composition and raising some powers, multiplication. You can do those operations effectively, and the fact that it's polynomial rational, I believe, makes almost no difference. Although, maybe, I mean, maybe with a completely different approach, you could... Uh, you can make it much smaller, I, I really don't know. And <clears throat> uh, also another variant, so if you don't like systems of equation, you can also take Rubel result and fix it in some sense. So you could also rephrase this result this way. There is a fixed differential algebraic equation such that for any f and for any epsilon, you can find a set of initial condition such that the solution will be unique and will be analytic and will satisfy the initial statement of Rubel. So here you see the added part is the fact that the solution is unique and analytic, which is of course not obvious. Uh, but uh, that's not my favorite formulation. Though. 
Okay, so how does it work? How do you prove a result like this? So essentially we're going to do what Shannon was doing. We'll, we're going to program those differential equations to approximate those functions everywhere. And um, I don't want to dwell too much into details, but it, uh, essentially what happens is that we take this class of functions, those generable functions, they're satisfied with differential equations. Okay, so th this is the original definition. Uh, we generalize this in several dimensions, so we can do it in multivariate, uh, and we can also do it for partial functions on connected domains, so uh, not, not just total functions. And then we observe that this class is very nice, so all the functions are analytic, it contains all the elementary functions that you want, and then you can add them, multiply them, divide them, compose them, uh, put them again in initial value systems, and again, you get a, uh, another function in that class. So in fact, when I say polynomial differential equations from the get-go, I'm not writing polynomial equations at all. It's too hard. So I'm going to write other kinds of equations, and then I know from those results that you can always rewrite them as a polynomial, which is the reason why they had, there are 300 variables in there. So as I said, writing polynomial Ds by hand is really hard. So what we do is that we start with those generable functions. They're kind of functions we know they're really good, they're exact everywhere. And we build some like nice gadgets that then are going to help us to build the like horrible function that approximates everything everywhere. So here is um, one example. And before like giving a statement, let me give you like the problem. So if we believe that theorem is true, then, for example, it should be true for f equals, so f of x equals, say, a ceiling function or a rounding function. So uh, I, I make it maybe continuous as I want. So it's a function like this. So if the theorem is true, then there should be some function that somehow approximates that function everywhere uniformly with parameters. So you, may, you might wonder, is it how, how do you build a function like that? So one of the first results we prove, because it's actually really useful to round, is this construction is something horrible like that. So you prove, well, there exists a generable function. So it's a function that satisfies a differential equation. It has more parameters, so it's actually a, a more of a partial differential equation, such that it approximates your function really well everywhere. And then you see there's a problem that happens really often when you try to prove those results is that you can't really hope for your approximations to be really good everywhere in the sense that your function is analytic. So it's hopeless to have a function being exactly equal to value over an interval. So you always have some kind of wiggling going on. So you make it, so you prove like it's small. And then every time you've got like a, something non-continuous happening, then you smooth things using a uh, like small zone where it's wrong. And so what you do is that you spend all your time proving things like up to some point. So your function approximates really well everywhere except on small zones. And everywhere it's kind of ep like epsilon close to your function. And then you, from there you, you go on. So you compose approximations and you have to make sure things don't explode. So here's one, one example. So I'm going to give some formulas just to give you an idea of why, why this thing is, becomes horrible really quickly. I mean, it's just like a show of slide if you want. So for example, how would you, how would you round? So you say rounding is easy, well, just take the tangent of the tangent. Well, almost works, but it's not defined on some points. So then you rewrite, it, you rewrite it a bit differently and you say, well, really the problem of that function is that the cosine is not defined like the one over cosine is not defined sometimes. So then you say, and the sine is not an analytic function either. So then you approximate the sine function by noticing that the sine function is actually fairly close to the tangent, hyperbolic tangent, if you push it far away. And then you notice that, well, since the cosine is going to zero and making, making things explode, you just modify the cosine so that when it goes to zero, it actually goes just above zero but not to zero quite. So now you've got one over something that's never zero. So we've got a function that's 
fairly close to your rounding function. And of course, all of this, now you have to introduce parameters to make it formal. So all of this is informal, but the hard part is, uh, you know, how, how do you approximate those things in a uniform way? And this is just, for example, the expression that you obtain for that particular case. And you might see why you get 300 variables. So, uh, you see, it, it's, it's kind of nasty, but it, it uses all the things I've said before. So you've got some elementary functions, like hyperbolic tangent, uh, cosine, sine, tangent. Then you've got some composition, you've got some division, square roots, have to be careful about that one, composition. So by the lemma, this thing is in my class. So you see it's, uh, it, it's really horrible. So it's just to say, like, uh, that's why we don't produce those polynomials explicitly. So have, you, you can be, it can be done. And once you have those gadgets, here comes the fun part. So you have a function and you want to approximate it. Here is an idea. If the function was, say, 0, 1 everywhere, so it's either 0 or 1, and say it's like really regular, so it's either 0, 1 for like units of time, so it's like a binary stream if you want, then somehow you want to encode those digits in a number alpha. Like the digits of alpha would give you the function, and somehow you just need to extract those digits from this number alpha that would be the initial condition. And so this is, this is really tricky. It can be done. I'm going to explain a little bit. So the idea is that you start with a number alpha that encodes your function, and then you decode it in some sense to obtain a function like that. Okay? And if you think about it, this is not so surprising. Every time you listen to music, your computer is doing exactly that. Right? Music is an analog signal, and it's in digital form on your computer. So somehow... There's a digital to analog converter in your computer doing this. So we're doing the same thing, but uh, well, much more precise. I have to make sure it works, theory. But so this can be done. And that's the first step. You approximate all functions, they're ellipsoids and bounded, and you do that with fixed precision. And once you know how to do that, there's a non-trivial step, which is how do you go from functions that are Nice, so the ellipsoids bounded, you're not to approximate this with fixed precision, to approximate any function. Because really the f, it could be, it could grow really quickly, for example. Or it could be, uh, I don't know, sine of 1 over t, so it could oscillate really, really quickly. So that here there's a non-trivial step of how you go from nice functions to not nice functions. I'll explain both. So let's see how we do this. Um, Suppose you want to generate like some zeros and ones. So I give the, the idea. You, you can look at the equations, although I don't recommend it. The first observation is that if you have a number alpha, you can kind of extract the digits of alpha using some function. So you can build a function that is like one and then zero, depending on how the digits of alpha are. <coughs> so it, it looks reasonable, but how do you do this exactly is not so hard. So you can build a function such mm -hmm. that between n and n plus 1, its value is 0, 1, depending on whether the nth digits of alpha is 0, 1 in base 2. And then you generalize this. You say, now in instead of having a sequence of zeros and ones, I have a sequence of rational, actually di dyadic numbers. And I want to produce them at specific in like times. So you build a function that's like changing a lot, it's wiggling a lot, and then you show that because it's changing so much, if you look at it at the right moment, then it has the value you're looking for. So like you see, it's, it's changing a lot, it's complicated, but there's a, it's a, there's a particular time, a0, where it takes the value I want, then a time, a1, where it takes the value I want, and a time, a2, where, where it takes the value I want. But the problem is those times, they're complicated. We know they exist, but we don't. They're complicated. So then you combine the two of th those two things. You have on the top a function where you, you control exactly when it's zero, when it's one, and at the bottom you've got a function that's complicated, it's wiggling a lot, and it takes the values you want sometimes. So then you can see the one at the top. It's like the signal that tells you that's the value I'm looking for. 
Okay, so you're kind of extracting uh, interesting values from a really noisy function, and uh, that's the really hard part that I cannot, cannot explain. Is how do you make a differential equation that has two signals, and somehow it copies the second signal when the first one is one and does not when it's zero. So that that's essentially what it's doing. Okay, so you're extracting a value from from a noisy function using a, a signal. And yeah, uh, I'll, I'll give some kind of idea of how you do this, but that's really the uh, that's really the tricky part. So, but you see, otherwise those two signals, uh, there, those are just expressions, right? Uh, I, I can write down the expression. I mean, how do you come up with this is another question, but you can really write it down. The 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 part that's tricky is that one. So that's not that's not the part I want to really insist on. The point is, once you know how to do this, you can do almost piecewise functions, like almost piecewise constant functions. Like this signal you see, you take the value, you copy it for some time, and then you copy another value for some time. So sure, you can approximate some functions that way, but not all functions are like this. So uh, the problem is that all the functions we can do like this are bounded by one. They're, they have to change really, really slowly. Because of course this thing of you copy and then you wait for the next value, that's the good one. It could take a really long time before the function actually takes the value you want. So it, you don't even know when it's changing. And so that, that's the interesting part. We have to go from this to any function. Okay. So if, you, if, you, if you're a bit lost, you can imagine that uh, it's like we have approximated function on the bounding interval, for example. So it's unbounded, but on a bounding interval, it's easy, but then you want to you do it over everything. And here, there's a question that what we're trying to do, is it even possible? Because is it really true that you can build an equation that has arbitrary growth? And the reason why I'm asking this is that here, the f that we're trying to approximate, it could be a really, really fast-growing function. I don't know, something that grows faster than any tower of exponential, for example. Now that means if we really want to approximate that function f, we have to build a differential equation that grows at least as fast as this. And, you know, is this really possible? Well, it's unclear at first, because if you try to do this, like try to build an equation that grows really quickly, you might say, what's, what's the worst I can do in one variable? Well, clearly in one variable you can do exponential. If you do it with two variables, you play around a little bit and you convince yourself you can do a tower of two exponentials, right? Using the previous one, you multiply the derivative by exponential and then you've got exponential of exponential. And then you look around a little bit more and with two variables, I think you can actually prove this is the best you can do up to maybe a polynomial factor. So now you say with n variables, what's the worst I can do? So it's easy to see you can do a tower of n exponentials, precisely the way I've done it for two. And then you try, you try harder, and you don't come up with anything that's growing faster than the tower of n exponentials. Maybe with a polynomial factor in the t. So now you're like, well, that's bad, because now my theorem is clearly not true if I cannot do any better than this. So you look more and then you realize, well, the situation is, is, is desperate because Borel actually conjectured that you cannot do any better than this. So it turns out that Borel was interested in this. He couldn't find any counterexample and he thought that's, well, surely that's true. But it turns out someone came up with a counterexample to this. So that was four years later. Uh, this is really not well known. It's like... Uh, it's like a one-page paper in the Académie Française of Mathematics. Um, and the example is extremely simple, which is really striking. So take that function, 1 over 2 minus cos t minus cos alpha t. You can see what happens. If alpha is not a rational multiple of pi, well, actually, it has to be transcendental, um, it's not possible for the cos t and cos alpha t to be 1 at the same time. Because you can't, unless t equals 0, you cannot have t to be a multiple of pi and alpha t to be a multiple of pi at the same time. 
but uh, I mean, it's Typhon sign approximation. You can have them simultaneously arbitrarily close to being multiples of pi. That means that function for well-chosen alpha is going to spike sometimes because you're going to get extremely close to being zero in the denominator. And by choosing alpha really well, and that's the, it's actually once you know how it works, it's not so hard to choose the alpha, you can show that this function is spiking and the spikes, it can go arbitrarily high for well-chosen alpha. So for any, um, like for any function f, you can build an alpha such that eventually at some point it's going to spike higher. But when exactly, this you don't know. And another feature of that thing is that the spikes are really, really far apart from each other. But at least it's a counterexample to Borel's conjecture. Although that's not going to be quite good enough for us, but it's an interesting starting point. So what we did is that we uh, generalized this. We showed that uh, actually if you give, you can build a uh, polynomial equation such that for any function f, you can, be, you can choose the solution so that it grows even faster than f everywhere. It's not just a spike. It's not just faster, bigger than f at some point. It's bigger than f everywhere just by tweaking the initial condition. So it's like a, a counterexample uh, on steroids, if you want this, really uh, have to make it much, like, much worse. And an interesting feature of this example is that I do not believe there is any counterexample to Borel's conjecture only using algebraic numbers in the coefficients. So in fact, if you take the previous example here, you take alpha to be algebraic, you can show this is a, a really tame function. Because the fact that it's algebraic makes uh, t and alpha t kind of far away from being zero, like multiples of pi at the same time. So you really have to have alpha transcendental for this example to work. And so I think, yeah, Borel's conjecture is still open if you only have algebraic coefficients. Uh, but probably this is a really hard conjecture to prove. Uh, So how do we do this? Um, so in fact, to prove this result and to prove other results, it comes down at the end of the day to the following thing. You have a function, f, and you want to iterate that function with a differential equation. That's really the core of the proof, in fact, if you think about it. Like, how do you iterate a function, f, with a differential equation? So what do I mean by that? In fact, the rounding function is, is such an example. You give me f, so it could be, I don't know, x equals 2x or x equals x plus 1. And I want to build an equation such that from time 0 to 1, the differential equation should be essentially equal to f of x. And then I want that this equation from time 1 to 2 should be essentially equal to f of f of x. And then here it's doing something. And then I go on. So here it should be equal to f iterate three times of x. And the reason why you want to do this is, uh, well, because iterating things is much easier. It's much easier to reason about iterating functions to build stuff rather than differential equations. And in fact, the trick is that you can actually do this. And the, the idea is nice, the details are, are not. The idea is you have two variables, y and z. And initially, y prime is going to be 0, well, almost 0. So it's going to be equal to x. In the meantime, z is going to satisfy a differential equation that says z should be equal to f of x, or f of y. That means, another, in other words, you say, z prime is equal to the difference between z and what it should be. So that z is converging really quickly to f of y. Okay, so we can check this equation works. So at time one half, now the variable z is very close to being what I want. And now I reverse the process. From time one half and one, I make z constant and y should like catch up with the other function. 
And it's the same process, like, except that now Z is trying to uh, be the same thing as uh, the other one. And when I'm, I'm, I am in time one, I can do it over again, because you see I'm in the same position as uh, at time zero. Both functions are equal to f of x. So if I do it again, at time two, both will be equal to f of f of x. And uh, you can iterate functions that way. And once you know how to iterate functions, uh, it's really cool because essentially if you take the previous counterexample of the function that's spiking, well, if you iterate that function in the right way, it's going to spike much more often and it grows really fast. Uh, the copying part, copying is essentially this. Uh, here you see we're kind of, a function is applying something of the other, but copying is exactly that way. So once you know how to do this, you know how to do everything. Of course, the hard part is that, uh, you know, I have two different behaviors, but those are, you cannot do this with a polynomial. A polynomial differential equation doesn't have two behaviors depending on time t. So you have to emulate this with functions and it makes mistakes. So your system has errors and you have to correct the errors all the time. You have to make sure the errors don't uh, destroy your computation. But it's, uh, it, it can be done though. And at the end you've got this. So wh why do you have this? Because once you have really fast growing function, you take your function f and you start by dividing f by a really, really fast growing function to make it, makes it bounded by 1. Now this function f, it might change too quickly, so now you compose f by the inverse of a fast growing function. And you remember, like inverse and all of this, you can do it. So if you, if you compose a function by the inverse of a fast growing function, it's changing really slowly. And so now you've got a function that changes super slowly, it's bounded by 1, and you apply this stuff I've done at the very beginning, and you approximate it. And now you do it everything the other way around. And you have to show it works, but it, but you can do it. And of course, like uh, all of this takes a lot of variables, so I think it's a few hundred, but uh, I'm not sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the complexity, the complexity being analyzed by polynomial differential equations? So, um, well, I I know there are examples. That I think it's like this um, either it maybe the interior point method. Like, there's a method of optimization, like for uh, finding extremal points of uh, some sets. There are actually discretization of differential equations, I believe. In fact, the, the fact that they work really well comes from the, a differential equation. I think the original methods were like this, uh, but I can't remember the details. Uh, but in, in, clearly that's not a really common uh, common thing. You can, you can uh, actually in other work I've, I've shown that you can characterize complexity theory with differential equations, but uh, probably it's often easier to come up with a polynomial time algorithm rather than polynomial time polynomial time differential equations, so I'm not sure. But for optimization, maybe like it's, you can build equations that converge really quickly to solutions, and it's easier than doing numerical analysis. Yeah, playing around with trying to solve linear or ordinary differential equations with um, nowhere differentiable functions as coefficient functions. And do you know anyone else who's done work in that? And and also, is there a solution to like linear ODEs using only integrals? But I mean, in the limits of integrals, uh, so that you never actually do any differentiation. I'm just curious if you know anybody done that kind of work. Um, like to... um, <clears throat> I know. Um, so the uh, first person who's worked with me, let me go to the very beginning, probably there's a way. So Olivier Bournes, I think he has worked on questions like um, you have uh, what we called a function, like we call it a function algebra, but it's probably it's a different meaning. So you, you have uh, some basic functions, and then you have some operators, and then you apply all the operators to those, to those functions, you build new functions, 
and you, you end up with some functions and you say, is that, is that class of function the set of polynomial time computable functions? So in a computer science, uh, computer theoretical sense. And I think he has showed, he has looked at stuff like this. So you start with say polynomials and the operators would be uh, take a limit at, at infinity and maybe solve a linear differential equation using coefficients in what you've previously done and look at the class of functions you can build that way. And that would be the closest uh, to your question. And I think you can show that under some conditions, probably you have to restrict those operators. You can have polynomial, all the polynomial time computable functions in some sense. Suppose you start out when f is already analytic mm -hmm. um, and in fact solves uh, a differential equation that you know. That, uh, does the y1 end up being close to the derivatives of, of f? Does it have any connection with the other equations f satisfies or anything? I, I don't think so. With this construction, the, I mean, probably you could approximate the derivative if you want. Like you, you could approximate any finite number of derivative if you wanted, but if you just apply it like this, the, the function will be probably like, and my guess is what if, if you look, it would be something like that. So the derivative would be horrible, would uh, strain, like change all the time. And uh, so no, the derivative would be, would be uh, a mess, I think. Uh, I mean, there's no reason why you, this could magically produce a nice function if you knew the function is nice. Uh, because of the construction, you expect the solution will always be um, like messy, but the same mess for all functions. Because it, it's very uniform, right? You just change the initial condition. The way the system behaves is the same for all values. So one thing I haven't said uh, as well is that, of course, if you plug in a wrong initial value alpha that is not given by the theorem, the solution will explode in finite time. Uh, I should have said that probably. Like the theorem tells you there's a way to choose the initial condition, but of course the theorem does not tell you uh, what happens for other initial values. And probably it explodes in finite time. Can you For alpha? Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's interesting. So if I go, there are two pieces of that alpha. So one piece is that is built from this. So here you apply, uh, so alpha will be the digits of some function that is built from f. Probably it's, it's kind of complicated, but there's an expression for this. What, what is the function you're approximating here? Same for there. And the only place where the alpha is like not obvious is this one. And here alpha is built, it's a, built from a series. So you can say alpha is the sum for all n of some value. And you can compute that value for all n. Uh, so here the description is not so, so nice.